Really appreciate you folks showing up here today. And we've got about an hour to spend together, so we might as well enjoy it, make the best of it. I'm going to make a statement that I made when I was the keynote speaker for the Canadian Dowser several years ago. And it goes something like this. I have found a group of people that I really believe are potentially the most powerful people on earth. And I have some good news and I have some bad news about this. The good news is, it's you, the doubters. The bad news is, most of you don't have a clue. No offense intended. That's just the way it is. And how, why do I say that? It's because folks are not using their potential to make the world a better place to live. It's not so much that we have a lack of ability. It's just that we're not using it. So what I want to do today is talk to you about some various stories, um, some, uh, all of them one way or the other about dowsing, and to give you an idea of what is possible. Because as I said in the introduction last night, in order to accomplish something, we got to believe such a thing is possible. Or at least we have to be so ignorant as I am not to know we can't do it. And that's the way we've done a number of things. That's the way we took arsenic out of water. That's the way we took chlorine out of water. We didn't know we couldn't do it. And we've accomplished quite a bit, simply because we didn't know we couldn't. So um, what I want to tell you a bit about dowsing here, uh, why that we have this potential, is because, and, and I guess maybe a number of people have discovered this, but my friend Ed Stillman with the Sedona dowsers uh, there in uh, in Sedona, Arizona, did some brain frequency research at the uh, o, uh, Ozark Research Institute at some point. I want to just run uh, a few ideas by you, uh, tell a few stories, tell you about what uh, we're doing with dowsing, and give you some ideas of what can be done. Uh, I'm the president founder of the Raymond Grace Foundation, and among our major projects are showing people, teaching people, sharing information, whatever, on how to clean up the water in the world. This, I just saw this as an opportunity to help the folks over there. If they were nice enough to come over here, well, yeah, let's send them something back home they can use. Uh, right now, as far as I know, we are reaching people in excess of 35 countries. And most of it is about water. Not all of it, but most of it is. And what we do, we have a monthly video that we've been putting out now for, I guess, a year and a half. That we put a video online for a month on various subjects, uh, most of it uh, related to dowsing in one form or another, but not entirely all of it, but just things that we think that would be beneficial to folks. And uh, we figured, well, we can do that, reach a lot of people in various parts of the world. I actually think we can do that cheaper than uh, we could even uh, pay the postage to mail it to them a lot of times. So uh, that's going over pretty good. I want to tell you about one we did, because one of our other projects is to eliminate or at least greatly reduce abuse uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the world. It's always bothered me that people, innocent people, especially kids, are abused. And I've always just had the attitude, if I don't do something, nobody else probably will, so I'm going to do something. I also have another attitude and a saying that if we do nothing, nothing's going to happen. If we do something, something might happen, so let's do something. Do I know what I'm doing all the time? No, just do it anyway. Part of the time it works. Matter of fact, many times it works. So um, back about two years ago, I guess, and I will have to be a bit discreet with some names here. But I was asked to take on a project of several hundred square miles over in Europe with uh, human trafficking. Now, that's what you and I would call a slave trade. And I didn't know this. I doubt that you do. But human trafficking is the third largest illegal operation on planet Earth, right behind weapons and drugs. Well, I didn't have a clue. So when I got the phone call from Europe asking if I would help in this matter, I picked the fellow's brain quite a bit. And I said, well, yeah, I'm willing to help. I've actually been hoping for an opportunity like this, but how are you going to know it works? And he said, there is one specific spot, and this was an area of several hundred square miles, 
that is among the worst, if not the worst, in the entire world. It would be what we might call a point of a transfer point, where people, mostly young girls, some young boys, are abducted from their home country, usually third world countries, taken here, and then sent off to the country of destination. And he said, we have a lot of people monitoring this. And if anything changed, he said, I would know it almost immediately because of the reports I would get. And I said, well, this, this is good. What are you doing to stop it? And he said, we're not doing anything. We don't know how. I said, okay, here's the deal. I will take on your project, no strings attached except one. You got to give me some feedback. I always demand that when I work on, on projects. You don't owe me anything. We're just willing to do it for you. To see, I, because I wanted an experiment that we could verify that what we were doing was working. It took about two and a half months to ever get any feedback on it, but I got a phone call one day saying, the human trafficking in this area has been reduced dramatically. Will you come over here and teach this to people? And I said, no, I have no desire to come over that part of the world, um, but we, we still would like to help you. So we figured, okay, the best way to do this is to film it. So we created a film and we called it Blueprint for Freedom. Now filming isn't too much of a job, figuring out what the title to put on it's a little bit more difficult. So that's what we called it, Blueprint for Freedom. In this film, I addressed everything that I could possibly think of that would contribute in any way from a person being possessed who was dealing in this trade to the people with a victim mentality that were being the victims and everything else I could think of that was associated with it. So uh, Faye, who is doing the filming back there now, and I made, made a film of this, and this is how we operate. We've, she, she filmed it, edited it, produced it, put it online, and we had it in 10 countries in less than three days and spent less than $1,000. Now, that's how we do business. And the reason we can do this, we don't have a committee. We want to do something, we just do it. That's how God created the earth in six days, rested on the seventh, he didn't have a committee. So uh, we, we just kind of followed the same, uh, same plan. Uh, we normally would charge about $15 for folks watching these films. $15 a month, and now you play it as many times as you want, invite any neighbors. And I said, no, let's don't do this. Let's give this one away. And we did. We gave it away for a couple of months, and as far as I know, it has reached in, I'll have to say, over 30 countries. We know our newsletter goes to at least 35, and I figure the film has gone to that many or possibly even more than that. So in whatever we're doing out there, whether it is cleaning up water, whether it is stopping abuse, whether it's stopping uh, clearing up dangerous spots on roadways because we're doing this, I want to tell you something about that. Dowsing is the key behind all of this. But really, the power of intent or the power of your mind is the, really the key behind dowsing. Dowsing is simply a movement of an object that causes your left brain to believe that you're actually doing something. It is for the folks who do not really totally believe in their own power. Now, there's nothing wrong with it. We use it. I've used it for years. I teach it. it but it is a way to improve your accomplishments with a focused mind. Or another way of saying it, it is a way for you to focus your mind. And there's not a thing wrong with it. Uh, but... What I want to get across to folks is the real power is in your mind, not in this 45 bullet that I do dowsing with. You know, it has no power of its own. The power is up here between your ears, but it's a good tool, and that's, that's really all it is. So uh, just wanted to say that because a lot of folks, for some reason, have trouble learning to douse. And frankly, I was one of them. It did not come easy. I had to work at it for quite a long time. I just wouldn't give up, just too stubborn. And finally, got pendulums to move and started doing some work with it. But for the folks who just don't 
seem to be able to get doubting tools to work for you, all it takes is your focused mind, the power of intent. That's all it is. My friend Jeff Jones, who I talk about a lot, and he's in a couple of our films, never picks up a pendulum. He simply dowses with his mind. He simply pretends he's got a chart and he pretends where the pendulum swings. Simple as that. So you can do the same thing. So I want to just give you some ideas today of, of what can be done. And at the end, if there's time and you want to, we'll try to take a few questions. Now, I had some notes here. Among the things that some of my friends have done, not necessarily with doubting, but with the, a focused mind and strong intent, was down at Faye from down in Georgia. And I guess a couple of years ago, there was a severe drought. And her garden was drying up. The leaves on the corn was curling up. The leaves on the bean was wilting. And she was out there one evening looking at the garden. And she said, if we don't get rain within a day or so, I'm going to lose the whole garden. And then she had an idea. Instead of making rain fall from the sky, why don't I braise the water table and just water the roots? It didn't rain for six more weeks, and she had a wonderful garden. So you don't always have to pray for rain. There's nothing wrong with it, but if you don't have that option, bring the water up from the, from the ground to water the roots. Now, I got an email from the Australian dowsers a few months back saying they had had a severe drought, and they sent a picture to prove it. It was a picture of a pier going out in a lake that appeared to have been about 12 feet above the original water surface, and the, and the grass in the lake was knee high, and there was no water. And they said, can you help us? And I said, well, about all you really need to do is thank your nature spirits and invite the spirit of the rain. It started raining. They gave us a pretty good write-up in their newsletter there in Australia. So most of this stuff is just pretty simple. Now, my friend Benny Pig over in Charlotte, North Carolina, is a carpenter. He's not a real careful carpenter. So one day with a table saw, he managed to remove the entire first joint of that finger. And someone asked him, well, Benny, why didn't you pick it up and have the doctor sew it back on? He said, there wasn't anything to sew on because that saw blade come in at the end of it and just literally mangled it. He didn't get too excited. He just energized him some water like he had learned how to do in the class, and wrapped a cleaning rag around it, and went on back to work. In our Energized Water DVD where Faith filmed him, 16 days after the finger had been cut off, Benny's already got a fingernail grown back. Now, the only problem was, at the time, that finger right there was still a joint shorter than the little finger. But within about two or three months, it grew out to its normal size. I mean, we've got this on film, and it's, you know, it's not any trick photo photography or anything. It wasn't even planned. Benny just showed up at a glass, started telling us about growing his finger back, so we took a picture of it. And, <laughs> you know, it's very obvious it's shorter than the other finger, but it, it grew back. And somebody said, well, Benny, how, how'd you do that? He said, well, I used to catch lizards as a kid, and sometimes you get a hold of a lizard by the tail, and he'd pull his tail off, and he'd grow it back. He said, I'm smarter than a lizard. <laughs> he just didn't know he couldn't do it. I mean, that's how we have done a bunch of stuff. Now, I got some really good, I got three good reports this week that I want to share with you folks. I'm so proud of them. One was a fellow by the name of Ray Arnold down in Corpus Christi, Texas, and I met with him out in Boulder, Colorado last week. And he said, uh, our house is on a canal there, and the water is about four or five feet deep, and it's always been just dirty water. And he says, we cleaned up, uh, used your film, we uh, energized some water, and we went out there and poured it in the canal. He said, within a few days, we could see the bottom, we see the fish down there. Now, the interesting thing is, the tide comes in and goes out, and that water changes every day, but it's still clear. Then I got an email on the 1st of June from a fellow I don't even remember, really, up in Minnesota. And he said, I want to tell you what you've done up here. He said, in your class, you 
offered to help us clean up any body of water that we chose. And I chose a lake, and it was Albert Lee, L-E-A, Lake in Albert Lee, Minnesota. That's right off I-35 in the southern part of Minnesota. And I haven't been there. Um, I mean, we're just in the general vicinity up there. And he said, that lake has always been just dirty water. He said, about a foot deep is as deep as you can see into the water. And he said, I thought I would take that on as a project. And he said, you talked us through it. And I just focused the energy on there. We found out we could do this. And he said, first, the fishermen started noticing it. Because it, I, it was just a matter of a few days that he got the word that the water in the lake is clear. We can see the bottom. We've never seen the bottom of this lake before. And he said, then it became the talk of the town. So then the, I don't know the exact uh, terminology here, but the water environmental people at Test Water came in and they tested six lakes in the area. Albert Lee Lake tested better than any lake in the history of the water testing. And he said, the only downside is, he said, you just ruined the fishing. He said, the water's so clear, the fish won't bite. <laughs> so uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. And then we had a guy in Dallas week before last that uh, said they had a, he and his wife were there, said they had a terrible uh, water problem. He said, our water in the well is so bad it will literally burn plants. Now, I haven't a clue what was in that water. I got the nicest email the night before I left saying our water tastes the sweetest and the best we've ever tasted. And that's why I gave those gentlemen from Korea a DVD. I want them to go back over there and clean their water up. We're helping people wherever people want help and are willing to do something. Now, am I willing to do it all for them? No, they're not going to learn anything. First off, I don't know that I could, but even if I could, I wouldn't. It's like you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, you teach him to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. You all heard that story. Okay, we're teaching people instead of doing it for them. So I um, just wanted to throw this idea out that these things are possible, and yes, you can do it. There's not any reason that you can't do it. Now, um, just a moment here. There's about three principles to my work, and they're very simple. One is... All things are composed of energy, and the intelligent human mind can change energy or properly direct energy. And if you're taking notes, let's make it simple. Everything's made out of energy, and you can change it. That's the first principle. Second principle is energy is impressed upon matter. And three, energy follows thought. Everything we do is based on those three simple principles. Yeah, I'll be glad to repeat it. Number one is... All things are composed of energy. We can change energy. Number two, energy is impressed upon matter. I tell folks, if you don't believe this, go visit a funeral home. Feel the energy. Go visit a party house. Feel the energy. What's the difference? The emotions of the people that visited these places. Thoughts and actions are impressed upon matter. Okay. And next, uh, in, um, energy follows thought. And that's why I tell folks, the first rule of success is think of what you want, not what you don't want. Why? Because whatever you're thinking about, you're sending energy to it. Real simple. Worry is a terrible waste of good energy. I mean, it's just a terrible waste of it. Why? Because worry is thoughts of what you don't want to happen, and you're feeding it. Whether you like it or not, you're still doing it. Now, one of the things that I really push quite a bit is helping kids. Now, we have started teaching a dowsing class at various places and just giving kids a free ticket because look around the crowd, folks. There's maybe 400 people here all together in the audience. And I've seen one kid, it was a little kid somebody was carrying. If we don't don't get younger people interested, then this what we've got here might not continue forever. The only thing I know of that keeps continuing because people get older is AARP. Uh, other, other organizations 
and movements and so on needs younger people to support it, to get it moving and so on. So uh, the only thing I knew to do was give kids a free class. So that's what we started doing. And I will probably continue to do that. We didn't get any great crowd, but what we got were kids that were really w willing to listen. And what impressed me about these kids, I think we only had about six or eight of them. This was out in Flagstaff at the conference out there. And they ranged from about nine years old to 16. And I said, look, I want to give you some ways here to uh, to make differences in your life. So I want you to pick what any project you want now. And I will, and you tell me what it is, because I could do that with a small class, and I will give you the best information I have to show you how to correct the problems or how to achieve your results or whatever it is you're trying to do. You know what those kids pick for projects? Every one of them, it was either their parents or their grandparents that they wanted to do something for. That impressed me. It really did. So I thought, you know, I, I didn't know they were going to do that. I thought they were going to try to get a new car or something like that. But they didn't. Every one of them wanted to help either their parents or their grandparents. So people helping people is what keeps people together, and it's how we make progress. So um, if anybody's got any ideas on getting this done, well, I'm kind of open to it. I'm a little short on time right now. I've only traveled 2,700 miles this week. Um, but, you know, given the opportunity, we, we like to, to promote uh, this in younger people, like to promote it in schools. And we're doing s some of that to a degree back home. Um, I have my kid in school right now. She's working for a couple of organ uh, environmental organizations of teaching kids uh, how to uh, clean up water, uh, even how to grow gardens, uh, where basically where food comes from. And uh, bottom line is, respect for the earth. So we're starting, we're, we're, we're kind of small at this really. Uh, we're having to learn as we go, but we're, we're making some progress. So uh, we're willing to expand. Uh, we may have to do it at our own speed, but we're, we're willing to do, do as much as we can. Now, let's see here, where else was I going here? Yes, uh, clean up schools. In every class that I teach, I always emphasize for the folks to bring a project to class, not a physical project that you lead through the door, but uh, what would you like to work on? And what I encourage people to do is pick the schools where their kids go to school, or grandkids, or any kid they like. What we then do is show them how to clean up the energy in the school. Now, some of you have come up and talked to me here. I have a little problem remembering who said what to me. But some of you have been telling me about how you've taken these things, you've been in our classes before, and you've gone out and done, uh, uh, used, these pro uh, used these, this information and cleaned up your kids' schools where they get along better. You've cleaned up your office where you work and all of this. I uh, get some very impressive stories from you folks, and I appreciate every one of them because it tells me that these methods work and that we actually have people out there that are using them and, um, and getting things done with them. Another thing that uh, you can do, which defies a lot of people's belief system, and that is clean up your local police department. <laughs> you don't think you can? Why not? I want to shoot down some theories here without offending anybody if possible. But this idea of you have to get people's permission before you do anything, there's no truth to it. I don't care how many times you've heard it. I don't care where it's recorded or anything else if it's engraved in a rock. There's no truth to it, people. How do I know that? Well, when people tell me that, I ask them, do you really, honest to God, think that I go out and track down serial killers and serial rapists and ask if it's okay if I alter their behavior? We've got a pretty darn good track record of cleaning up serial killers, serial rapists in the country. Now, do I scour, or go through the newspapers trying to find them? No, I don't. I wait until somebody has a problem and ask for help. I usually don't try to, well, first off, I don't read the paper and I don't watch TV, so I wouldn't know about it anyway. But um, give you an example. 
I don't think I've ever told this one to this group before. But back in, I guess it was 02, maybe, I'm not sure, I was out in Flagstaff, no, excuse me, Tucson, Arizona. And there was a lady came up to me with a uh, newspaper clipping, said there, it, there are 13 rape victims due to a serial rapist being at large on the University of Arizona campus at Tucson. And she said, would you please do something about this? And I said, well, if you'll give me some feedback. Well, I didn't hear anything for about four months, but I got an email one day saying there's not been any more cases like this happen. Well, I spoke out there last year. I'd already forgot the lady's name, but she stood up in the audience, she introduced herself, and she said, there was never another case after I asked you to work on it. Now folks, I haven't cornered the market on this stuff. I've got it out in at least two films and a book on how you do this stuff. And it's so simple, if you bat your eyes, you're gonna miss it. It's that simple. You just gotta do something, because if you don't, there ain't nothing gonna change. So one of the hardest jobs I have is convincing people that they are capable of something. Because, and I don't mean to bruise any feelings here, I just say things to make people think. And yeah, it challenges belief systems. But there's something you learn from the day you first went to school or first went to church. And you were taught it every day, but nobody ever told you they were teaching it to you. And what you learned was that you don't have any personal power. You have to ask someone else for permission for everything you do. You doubt this thing. Could you get up and walk out of a classroom and go to the bathroom without asking? No, you had to ask permission. What you learned, what they really taught you was, you don't have any power over your own life. You gotta give it to somebody else. My old buddy, Chief Two Trees, who was an old Cherokee man I thought the world of. Learned a lot from him over in the mountains of North Carolina. Had a statement one day, I've elaborated on it a little bit, and I've used it so many times I've worn it out, but it's still true. And that is, people have given their souls to the priest and the preacher, their health to the doctor, their money to the banker, and their kids to the school system, and in so doing, they lost the power to control their life. Why? Well, they gave it all away to somebody else. One of the things that I really do my best to promote is self-empowerment. Yeah, it comes in the form of dowsing. And you know the good thing about dowsing? It don't leave any tracks. <laughs> all people can think you've done something, but they ain't no way they can prove it. No way at all. That's why we design films, that you don't have to go and tell anybody what you're doing. Now, to my knowledge, it's never been done before in the history of the world. We just didn't know we couldn't do it, so we just tried it and experimented with it, and from the feedback we get, it works pretty good. Now, do you really need to film? No, not if you've got enough confidence in yourself, you don't. We just did that for the people who didn't believe in themselves. And they needed help, so we offered them some help. But what we wanted to do was prove to all the thinking people, and that's the only kind that we even try to reach, because we can't think, we can't help them. But we wanted to prove to all the thinking people, especially the dowsers, because the fact that you come to something like this, you didn't just come in because the door was open, you know, you had to pay to be here. Well, you're the kind of people I want to talk to. But you're the, you, and you're the kind of people I want to reach. Why? Because you're the only ones that can make a difference. The rest of the population don't know how. They haven't done it yet. What makes you think they're going to do it next year? If not us, then who? If not now, then when? So that's why we do things the way we do. Blunt, down to earth, to the point, yeah. But uh, I find out people get it better that way. So what I'm saying to you folks, if you're reasonably capable of dowsing, or at least willing to practice, start experimenting with what you can do. And take on projects that's important to you, important to your family. And just, just see what happens. You don't have to tell anybody what you're doing. Just do it. So um, recently, I'll alter this story just a little bit to protect the guilty and sometimes the innocent, maybe. But recently, I got a 
email saying that there was a specific, I'm being politically correct here, which ain't my nature at all, a specific gang that was coming into a specific town. I'm going to kind of eliminate where and who. To trash the town. Now, this town has been trashed by this group several years previously. And the, some of their emails had been intercepted. That they were coming in this time, and they were going to trash the town as never before. Now, by trashing the town, I mean they go into stores and they steal everything they can steal. One would distract the shopkeeper or whatever while somebody else steals something. They intimidate people. They literally, when they've checked into the motels, they turn the elevators into toilets, and I'm really being polite and mincing words here. And this had been going on every time they came to town. And this year, they were going to come back and really do it big time. You know something happened? Their plans got changed. I got a really nice phone call after the weekend was over. Wasn't any violence. Last year, they killed somebody, shot some kid in the back, killed him. This year, there weren't very many of them showed up. There was no violence. There was nothing on the news about it. No, I didn't get my name in the paper. No, the mayor don't have a clue who I am. Probably never will. It's just what you can do. So uh, just do something. Now, what do you do? How do you learn how? Well, we provide information to do that. You know, we're... We've got films on energizing your life. We've got films on water. We've got a little book on technique, real simple stuff. And we're going to be doing a class on Monday showing you how to do any of this stuff you want to ask about. All right. Now, let's talk about teaching kids. Um, when my kid was about 11 years old, I was teaching her to dials, and she didn't take to it as well as I wish she had, or at least I didn't think she was. And one day she asked if she could have a Dr. Pepper. And I said, now April, I've done checked that Dr. Pepper out, and I know the effect of that upon your body is about 45 below zero. On your scale of zero to 100% plus or minus, it's 45 on the minus scale. But here's the deal. I'll give it to you here, don't open it. Here's my pendulum. If you can raise the energy as high as a plus 70 on that scale, I'll give it to you. The little kid goes over and she sits down, she spins it round and round and round and round. And she comes back over there and hands it to me, and darn if it ain't a plus 90. <laughs> and I said, deal's a deal, kid. Here it is. So a few days later, I saw her eating a chocolate chip cookie. And I said, April, I didn't see you raise the energy of that cookie. She said, I don't have to. I said, why? I have programmed myself that anything that I like to eat that comes in my energy field is automatically good for me. <laughs> Never been able to prove it wrong. OK. Now, among the other things that you can do with dowsing is, by all means, make some money with it. I always tell people, come to my class, I appreciate you paying to be here, and I want you to take what you learn and get your money back, including your travel expenses, at least 10 times over. My friend Jeff, that I work with quite a bit, called me a month ago one Sunday morning and said, I just wanted to thank you. He said, you know, you, you've been helping me the like, last several years, and I've been following you along with this stuff. He said, I just got three contracts this week at total $12 million. Now, there's a, have, I've heard this repeated out here at Dowsing Conferences. You can't use this for personal gain. Well, folks, ain't nothing wrong with it for a hobby, but why not use it to, to improve things? I mean, did poverty ever solve you folks any problems? Never saw me any. So I encourage people, use dowsing to stack the deck in your favor, whether you're buying a car, whether you're buying a house, looking for a job, whatever it is. For example, I have a friend out in Iowa that is a realtor. And anytime I'm in that part of the country, I just give him a free class. Why? Because he's been paying me good for a few years, and it's good for business. Besides that, I like to produce winners. Losers are bad for business. And he was telling the audience up in Minnesota last year, he says, I've been working with this guy. 
I've made more money and I've made it easier than I've ever made in my entire life. This year alone, he saved me $5,400 on car trades. How'd we do it? Well, the first thing I did, I'll give you an example. He wrote me one morning, I'm going to have to trade cars. I have found one at this certain dealership for $17,999, I believe. I'm going to go buy. And I wrote back and says, no, don't buy from them. They're thieves. How do I know? I checked their integrity. Was I in, invading their privacy? Sure I was. They were invading his pocketbook. Okay, so I don't have a problem with that. Every rule that you make for dowsing, you have just disempowered yourself one more step. Only rule I have is respect. And I don't really respect thieves. I respect honest people. So I said, no, don't buy that. Don't buy the car from them. Uh, send me a list of all of the dealerships within a 50-mile radius of your area where you live, and I'll tell you where to buy your car. Well... He sends me a list. I find one honest dealership in the whole area. I says, go there, they've got your car. He writes back, oh, he's so happy, they've got it, and it's $3,000 less. He says, I'm going over and buy it in the morning. I says, no. He said, but they only want $14,000. I said, I'll offer them 13, they they're gonna take it. They did. I don't know, I simply asked, what is the lowest, possible, lowest fair price they'll take for the car? He said, $13,000, I said, I'll offer them that, they'll take it. See what I'm talking about? Use your stuff to make money with. You're going to put your time and effort into it. So why not use it? Why not win? I'm sure if the car dealership hadn't made money, they wouldn't have sold it. So did we cheat them? No. We just kept them ripping him off any worse. So, see, I question most everything I've ever been told. Not only do I question, I don't even believe most of it. So every rule I hear... I just say, does this make any sense? And most time it don't. I mean, we just got way too many. God, we've got what the last count was two or three million laws trying to enforce ten commandments. So more rules ain't, ain't going to help us any. Uh, just, just thinking will help. I only ask two questions when I get new information. First question is, does it work? The second question, does it help? There ain't no reason to ask the third question. If it worked and it helped, that's all matters. So I'm constantly looking for something that works and something that helps. And when I get it, first thing, I'm my own first customer on most of it. And then I apply it to my friends. And if it works for them, then I apply it to uh, take it out and share it with people. Okay, I think I had another thing. Yes. Um, this was one story we got. This was on our, um, I think it's on our newsletter. It's maybe, maybe somebody here in the audience, I don't know, but it was right over here on Lake Champlain. The um, folks had a well that was full of sulfur. Now, I don't know anything. I mean, we better water dowsers in this room would probably forgot more than I know about water dowsing. Um, and I'm not in competition with anybody, not by any means. Uh, we're all hopefully working together. But this fellow had a lot of sulfur in his well. And he's there's sulfur in all the water around here. Uh, that's just one of the prices we have to pay for living here on the lake shore. So I told him about how to clean up the water. He takes some out, pours it down his well. And by golly, within about four hours, he goes outside. He said, there's these fumes and fog coming up out of the ground. I've never seen that before. It smells terrible. Within three or four days, water's perfectly clean. No sulfur. What do you do? Just take it out of it. Now, I think we're on to something, folks. I'm just not sure how far we can go with it, and we'll probably, as far as our minds can stretch. The folks down in Dallas, week four last, asked me a lot of questions about the oil spill. And I, my only honest answer I had for them, I have no experience whatever with oil spills. Yeah, we've worked on water all over the, the country. Yeah, we've had good results, but I've never worked on an oil spill. I want to throw out an idea here, folks, and all it is is an idea. I haven't done it. I, ha I mean, I've tried. I haven't seen results, any documented results, so I honestly can't tell you it's going to work, but maybe it will give you an idea, and maybe you can make it work better than I have. People ask me, how did you take the arsenic out of that water up there in Canada? I just asked if I could turn it into water. 
turn the arsenic into water. That's all I knew how to do. I use a term, and I call it scramble the frequency of things. Well, I scramble the frequency of arsenic and has to adjust it, to, this is the terminology I use, adjust it to, to the frequency of pure water. And there was 46 parts per million of arsenic in this water after it had gone through the best filtering systems a man could buy. He calls me two months later after the Canadian government tests the water and he said, 90% of the arsenic is gone. I said, okay, that's fine. Wait a few months, have it tested again. Let me know. The next call I got was there was barely a trace of it. They could barely find it. Where did it go? Well, we tried to turn it into water. Okay, we, uh, we used to give away free water filters. Not physical ones, mental ones. I mean, it didn't, we didn't have any overhead there, so we were glad to give them away. <laughs> The only problem was we had more people wanting them than what I had time to talk to all the folks on the phone and all of that. And it was just getting, a, you know, it was taking up a lot of time. So it was, okay, what we're going to do, we're going to create a film. And what I do, folks, I donate my time and effort and what information we have to our foundation. And we sell these, and these are fundraisers for the foundation. So, okay, let's create a water filter, a wonderful people can create a water filter, and then they can go and share it with their neighbors and friends and pass it around the world if they want to. That's, that's okay, we're, we're, that's what we're about, is get the word out there as best we can. There's not enough of me to do it, so I need people like you to do it. So that's why I share the information with you. So we've got a fellow, and he may be in the audience, I don't know, he's from Connecticut, he was in my Woodstock, New York class last year, and I, I let him talk for a while, and he's boggling his neighbor's minds because he's going up, hi there, uh, does your uh, water have um, chlorine in it? Well, yeah, it does. Well, taste it to make sure. Then he uses that film, puts on a mental water filter for them, and they can't taste the chlorine. Now, for limited thinking people, that kind of boggles their mind, and he's having a lot of fun with it. Really is, and doing a lot of good with it too. So you folks can do the same thing. And the real truth is you don't have to go to somebody's house to do it. You can actually do it anywhere in the world. Because in this work that we're doing, time and space are not a factor. They simply aren't. Actually, my best client for healing work is a little, was a little four-year-old kid in Hong Kong. And we got instant results. Now, that don't mean we get instant results 100% of the time for everybody. Folks, the only thing I know that works equally for everybody is the law of gravity. It seems to be fairly consistent. Everything else probably got, its ex got some exceptions to it. So uh, let's see if I had anything else here. Yeah, I've got to save a little bit for tomorrow night. Um, oh, another power of N10. I have a friend that got a call one day from a woman that was about eight months pregnant and it done, I don't know the words, uh, I would call it an x-ray, maybe it's an ultrasound or something, I don't know, but to what it was, the little baby, unborn baby's intestines were all, had all developed on the outside of the body. So the doctors advised her to terminate the pregnancy. Well, she didn't want to do that. So my friend did nothing more than start visualizing putting the intestines back into the unborn baby's body. When the baby was born, less than a month, or about a month later, it was about that much of the intestines sticking out. They simply poked it back in, took a couple of stitches, and sewed a hole up. So don't ever limit yourself on what you can do. People are always asking me, can I do this or can I do that? My answer has become standard. If you're smart enough to think about it, you're smart enough to do it. And that's usually just a, a standard answer. And I really believe that. Because see, if we think about something, there's a reason we're thinking about it. Are we about to run out of time? Okay. I think I agreed to talk for this long and then take some questions. So do we have a mic we can pass around through the audience or do I have to repeat the questions? I'm not hearing you. All right. 
does anybody want to ask anything? All right, go ahead, please. Now, you speak real loud because I don't always hear that good either. So maybe if you speak real loud, I won't have to repeat it. <laughs> and, and, oh, one more thing. Please use as few words as possible. Okay? Go ahead. I was just curious about your program with the, uh, the kids in the school and what kind of resistance you might have met with, you know, the powers that be in the school system. God bless you for answering that question. Now, the question was what I did to work on the school, what resistance I might have met from the powers that be. Oh, bless you. I love answering questions like that. Well, first off, the powers that be don't have a clue that I did anything. <laughs> and the reason why is I didn't believe in asking them if I could. So let me elaborate. At 14, almost 14, my kid said, Daddy, I'd really like to go to high school. I said, well, I'm going to miss you, but I realize you want to be around kids your age, so I will support you in whatever you want to do. If you go and make straight A's, I will be proud of you. If you go and fail every subject there, I'm still proud of you. And it will, the grades you make will in no way affect the way I treat you, because I will treat you the best I can no matter what. But there's a few things we're going to do and they're not negotiable. The first thing is, we're gonna go over and we're gonna visit the school, and I want you to go up to every teacher there and shake hands and introduce yourself because the kid's never done that to them before and they're gonna remember you. Next, I'm gonna clean up the entire school system. So we went over and it was a pleasant visit, and I started to leave, and I was talking to the teachers and I said, if my kid goes to school here. I want it to be a positive experience for everybody involved. So I'm going to clean up the energy in your school for you. There's not anything you can do about it. I hope you like it. <laughs> now, what happened three years later, she brings a teacher home with her after school. And I asked the lady, I said, how long have you been teaching? She said, five years. I said, any difference now in five years ago? Oh, yeah, a lot of difference. And I said, well, mind telling me what the difference is? Oh, well, we get along well now. She says, it's actually fun to be a teacher there. And then the light, I said, well, when does change? And she started thinking, oh, about three years ago. And she said, that's the year April come to school. What did you do? I said, did what I told them to do, a clean schooling. Now, you want to hear a funny side of it? About two years into this, April uh, my buddy Larry, who was, as some of you may know, he, uh, Larry Husho from up in Ontario, who at the time was the president of the Canadian Dowsers. And Larry and I were traveling buddies at the time all over the U.S. and Canada. And we came home and April said, Daddy, there's a beauty contest tonight. I'm going to be in it. I don't expect to win, but I'm going for the fun of it. I said, okay, Larry and I are going, and we'll sit in the auditorium and we'll, we'll applaud for you. So we went in and sat down. Larry was very energy uh, since the person, he looked over at me and he said, I've never felt the energy of a school like this. What'd you do to it? I said, you know what I did to it. Well, a year later, they had another contest and I went alone at night and I'm sitting out in the audience. And the auditorium probably holds 500 people and their aisles are full and they're around the walls and everywhere else. And I'm getting a little bored, so I just pulled out the pendulum and I said, how many of these rednecks are possessed? <laughs> well, I couldn't find any. And I'm thinking, well, I wonder why I can't douse tonight. So I went back home and I called Larry and I said, hey, Larry, remember that school we went to last year? Yeah. I said, well, I was over tonight, and I don't need a head count, but approximately what percentage of the people in that audience of 600 had any type of negative spiritual influence in any form? He said, I can't find any. I said, I can't either. And then I remembered what I'd done. I not only cleaned up the school board, the superintendent, the principal, the teachers, the cooks, the dishwashers, the janitors, the bus drivers, and the kids, I cleaned up the kids' homes and families. And it lasted. Now, did I know it was going to last? No, I didn't have a clue. But that's what you can do. And what did the authorities think about it? I didn't really care. <laughs> but I will say this. <laughs> At the, after doing what all I had done, and maybe the word got out, maybe it didn't. I don't know. 
But they had an achievement day or an awards day at the end of the school year for the kids who had made, uh, did community service or outstanding work or whatever. And they had a, a dinner for them and presentations and all that. There was 300 people there. The superintendent was on the other side and saw us and waited through the crowd of 300 just to come and shake hands. So I said that simply to say this. My work at cleaning up places, the way I do it, has, to my knowledge, never made any enemies or gotten any disrespect. What it has gotten is a tremendous amount of respect every time. Now, I'm sure if I had gone down and said, hey, I'm a dowser, and I work with energy, and I would like to work on the school, well, we'll have to appoint a committee to study this. <laughs> you know, no, you don't ask, you do it. Let me make a wild statement here before I close out. Well, I got time for maybe a few more questions. Folks, I seriously mean this. I don't know how you're gonna take it, but I hope you take it well. The fact that you are a citizen, a tax-paying citizen, of any county, town, city, state, or country. You don't only have a right to do it, you've got an obligation to do whatever you can do to make it a better place to live for your family. No questions asked. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Not only that, I will write, film, do interviews, or whatever, with no holes barred to show you anybody how to do it. I mean, somebody's got to do it. I just volunteered for the job. No, I ain't cornered the market on it. No, I would encourage you to do the same thing. You won't be in competition with me. It's just things that need to be done. And we have the ability. Like I said earlier, if not us, who, then who? If not now, then when? So any other questions? I hope somebody asked something. I got a few minutes left. Speak up, please. Thank you, ma'am. The question was, if I can summarize it, what do you do about clean up prisons? Is that a fair thing? Okay. Well, I'll tell you how we cleaned up the Albemarle County Jail in Virginia uh, two months ago. We had a lady in class there that was a volunteer worker at a, rim, at a women's prison. It was Albemarle, if I pronounce it right, Albemarle County, Charlottesville, Virginia. No, it doesn't bother me to call names and places. I left that one out a while ago to kind of protect other people. but. She was in class and she was asking if she could take that as a class project. And I said, certainly. That was on a Sunday morning. On Wednesday, I got an email. She had gone back to work there on Monday and the women told her that all hell had broke loose over the weekend. That they had a lockdown, they had fights, they had, it was just terrible. But something strange happened on Sunday morning all at once, things started feeling better. And by the time she got there on Monday, everything was nice and peaceful. We had worked on the project on Sunday morning. So what did I do? Well, in a nutshell, I will tell you what I did. I don't have time to get into the entire procedure, but in a nutshell, I depossessed the place and the people. That is what you always do. The first thing on working on any evil situation. That's what I did to the serial rapist. That's what I did to serial killer. The number one way to, de to depower an evil person is to depossess them. I know a lot of you civilized white people don't want to believe in stuff like this. I can't help it. It works. And I learned a lot of this from Walt Woods and Eugene Murray, who wrote the book on exorcism. Matter of fact, I'll tell a little story about Eugene. I was invited to speak at Ozark Research several years ago, back in 95, I believe it was. And at the time, I had gotten into some shaman training and gotten beat up very seriously. Not physically, but the spooks had came after me. And uh, that's why I was telling Bill, where we are here, be careful when you go back up there. Um, and I was looking for help. I knew I had a problem. I just didn't know how to fix it. And... Someone had told me, if you ever meet a man by the name of Eugene Murray, he has a lot of good information. 
So I walked up to him, and I don't know if, no, Sandy's not in the audience. She's already gone. I wish you could hear this. Okay, we'll show the film. Uh, Sandy and Eugene are sitting there having breakfast. And I walked up to Eugene, and I said, Sir, I apologize for interrupting your breakfast, but the truth is, I'm kind of desperate. I got a problem that I hadn't been able to shake. You think I'm possessed? And he says, no, but you do have a problem that you don't need. Now, you do have something in your energy field. And Sandy just volunteered. I'll take care of it. She said, what room are you in? And I told her. So she came over that night, and we talked for a long time. And I did not really understand exactly what she did. But I understood this. I woke up in a different world the next morning. Because when I got back home, I had left my truck uh, one of my friend's house, houses and uh, ridden out there with somebody else. I go over to pick up my truck and this girl looks at me and said, what happened to you? On the way home, I stopped to visit my construction buddies. They take one look at me. What happened to you? I get home. Nancy looks at me. What happened to you? Everybody could see that something had changed. I realized then that there were many people in the world suffering the same problem that didn't have a clue what to do about it. And I decided I would do whatever I could to make the information public, hopefully make it reasonably acceptable to people. But while I'm out there, the very next night, Eugene is making a talk. And people are giving him names of people, and he is telling them about the person. And I'm sitting there thinking, how is he doing this? So I raised my hand, and I gave him the first initial of a very good friend. And he said, he's suicidal. And I think, yeah, I know that. How do you know that? And then he did a mass clearing on everybody's projects and got up and walked out. I ran him down, grabbed hold of his arm. I said, sir, I'm not being rude. I'm just kind of desperate <laughs> again. So here's the deal. You tell me how you've done that, and I'll turn you loose. <laughs> and he told me, and I put it to use. And I have taught literally thousands of people, and now we're teaching them in at least 30, over 35 countries around the world how to do what Eugene Murray taught me how to do back in 95. I said, your, your words will never be wasted. And they have it been. So he was a, um, a key figure in this, and so was Sandy. So um, just... Uh, just kind of wish Sandy had been here to hear that, but I'll tell her about it after a while. Okay, we probably got time for maybe one more short question, if anybody has one. Oh, uh, speak up real loud, please. Can you tell us what Eugene taught you? Yeah. Well, not in two minutes, I can't. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what he taught me. Well, in two minutes, I can't. Well, okay, bottom line, he says, take the spirits to the other side, give them appropriate treatment, send them on where they're going. <laughs> bottom line. I know it's a short answer, but that's the one he gave me. Yep, yep, yep. I've got it in two films and one book, at least one book, maybe two. But it was that simple, that simple. Yeah, folks, what I learned is, if we, I get my spirit guide to do this. If we learn to work with the spirit world, we will accomplish far more than we will working alone. Now, your definition of spirit world may be different than mine, but as long as you get results, that's all that matters. So, yes, I'll get more hope... Well, in the class Monday, I'll get real deep into this, and I'm trying to answer all the questions. Right now, I'm just trying to hit the high spots here. And this lady here had a question, I believe. Just real quick, uh, when you were working on your daughter's school, or what she did, uh, was that a one-time thing? Or oh, when I was working on April school, was a one-time thing. I actually checked the energy two or three times later on, and I had to make some very minor corrections, but nothing major. And I don't really have time to get into all the minor corrections, but the energy on the earth is changing very quickly. And it's, I tell people, it's awful hard to take a bath. It's going to last you for the rest of your life. <laughs> you know, it just really can't be done. So whenever you clean up something, you're probably going to have to make some corrections as time goes on. And uh, one more, please. Uh, right here, please. Oh, I never really finished that about the golf, I guess. Well, let me try. Now, folks, I started to say this, and I got, I got off on another subject. What we're thinking is 
And please understand, I, don't, I haven't documented this. I don't know if I can, but I would like to. The same principle that we use to remove arsenic, chlorine, nitrates, and various other pollutants. The same thing we use to clear up the water up there in uh, Minnesota and the canal in Texas and the well in Austin, Texas last week. I don't know why the same principles would not work for oil. And this is the way I see it. If we could mentally break down the oil to its basic elements, we would have probably carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, and maybe one or two more. Well, if we broke it down to that, pollution would not exist. I've been thinking, if we, if we can reach a point, and we're working on it, and we just ain't quite there yet, I don't think, that we would be able to clean up the pollution in the world in less than three years. At least that's what my dowsing says. But we're going to have to get a little smarter before we do it. But we, we're gaining on it. We really are. And there's probably a lot of other things we got to learn, or maybe we just need more people like you putting your energy towards it. Maybe that's all it's going to take. But stop and think. When you break anything down to its original component, original element, would pollution exist then? I don't think it would. So we don't know we can't do it, so maybe we ought to give it a try. We got nothing to lose. The same thing would work for garbage. It, it'll work, I think it would work for anything. I don't know. I mean, I had a choice. I either told you that or I didn't. If I didn't tell you, nobody's going to know. Now, you might not know, but at least you've got an idea that it might work. So whatever you're going to do, folks, you're going to do it a whole lot better if you start incorporating dowsing into every phase of your life. You've been a wonderful audience. I appreciate you a bunch, and we'll talk to you tomorrow night. <laughs>